Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Argentina Facing Climate Change Agenda for the Care of Our Common Home. Without further ado, we give now the Zoom to Mr. Jorge Arguello, mm. Ambassador of Argentina mm. to the United States. Thanks, Luz. Good afternoon, everyone. It is a true pleasure to be here today to discuss Argentina's unwavering commitment to tackle climate change. First and foremost, I would like to thank our partner, the World Resources Institute for supporting us and co-hosting with the embassy this event. We appreciate having such an important institution working with us once again. Today, we have the opportunity to interact with Argentina's Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development, Juan Cavandier. Juan is a plain Key, is playing a key role in addressing climate issues and implementing such an ambitious agenda in our country. I also want to acknowledge the participation of the remarkable panelists who join us today. Helen Mountford, Vice President for Climate and Economics at the World Resources Institute. Pablo Vieira, Global Director of NDC Partnership and Lisa Vichidi, Vichidi, Director of the Energy, Climate Change and Extractive Industries Program of the Inter-American Dialogue. Today, we will all learn from them. As you may have heard, Argentina has adopted climate action as a state policy. Under the leadership of President Alberto Fernandez, this issue has returned to the highest level of our political, social, and economic agenda. Given the multiple crises the world is now facing due to the COVID pandemic, we do have a renewed opportunity to act towards a sustainable global recovery aligned with the goals set forth in the Paris Agreement. Integrating climate considerations into the post-pandemic world is an imperative. We must act now and we must do it together. Now, it is clear that our fight against climate change begins at the domestic level, but also needs global support and commitment through international cooperation for the care of our planet. In my capacity as ambassador to the United States, I would like to highlight the new opportunities that we currently have to work closely together in this regard with the new American leadership. We commend the priority given to climate action at home and abroad by the Biden-Harris administration. And I am sure that engaging in significant conversations with the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Change, John Kerry and his team, will lead to yet another fruitful chapter in our strong bilateral relationship. Allow me to say that I am thrilled about such a turnout today. And I want to especially thank all of you for your interest in our country's climate agenda. Finally, I want to extend our deep gratitude to our Minister of Environment, as well as to our remarkable panelists for joining us in this discussion. Without further ado, let's now hear from our Minister, Juan Cavandier. Juan, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Eh, un saludo especial a todos los participantes de este interesante encuentro, interesante y también necesario encuentro. Eh, como remarcaba también nuestro embajador en Estados Unidos, Jorge Arguello, nosotros como sociedad global tenemos una oportunidad de analizar este contexto del COVID para intentar ser mejores, para construir una nueva normalidad 
Pero también creo que no tenemos que esperar mucho tiempo para construir una nueva normalidad. Quizás nos encontramos hoy en día en esa nueva normalidad. Y es ahí donde tenemos que hacernos preguntas, preguntas estructurales, preguntas muy importantes, preguntas ontológicas, filosóficas. ¿Qué hemos hecho con nuestro planeta? ¿Cuáles son las prácticas que vamos a seguir teniendo? ¿Vamos a cambiar prácticas? ¿Vamos a mantenernos iguales? ¿Cómo vamos a abordar la agenda climática para el conjunto de los países teniendo en cuenta que, que existen diferencias y asimetrías muy grandes entre distintas naciones. Es por eso que ante esta crisis civilizatoria, la humanidad pensaba que tenía todo planificado, resuelto y que el futuro estaba en nuestras manos. Y, y esta pandemia, esta, esta crisis eh, ambiental, esta crisis por el coronavirus, nos enseñó que no todo es tan fácil como pensaba la humanidad. Por lo tanto, estamos caminando sin saber qué es lo que va a pasar, sin tener la certeza de lo que va a suceder en los próximos meses, en los próximos años. Hay algo que tenemos que tener muy claro, que no podemos continuar impávidos ante la realidad y tenemos que tener acción climática efectiva, para poder eh, construir un, un mundo mejor y que nuestra sociedad sea una sociedad que esté a la altura de las circunstancias de esta problemática tan grande. Pero también eh, nuestro país o nuestra región tiene un doble problema y yo quiero compartirlo con, con ustedes. Nuestro problema no solamente es la crisis por el COVID, sino que es también la crisis de deuda de nuestra región. Es decir, eh, además de afrontar todo lo que significa lo sanitario, los temas logísticos, las vacunas, eh, las infraestructuras sanitarias, médicas, también tenemos que afrontar vencimientos de deuda. Y es ahí donde muchas veces los organismos internacionales de crédito son muy exigentes con nuestra región para que tengamos una precisión eh, suiza en el pago de los vencimientos de deuda. Pero al mismo tiempo nuestra región es el orden ambiental de la humanidad, porque el patrimonio natural que anida en nuestros países sirve a la humanidad. Tenemos pulmones de aire, de oxígeno, de captación de carbono muy necesarios. Tenemos diversos ecosistemas, distintos sistemas de biodiversidad que benefician a la humanidad. Y eso hay que preservarlo. Pero para preservarlo, también necesitamos ayuda financiera. Ayuda financiera real, directa, para proteger nuestra, nuestro patrimonio natural. No una ayuda o un, una, una, un monto de dinero para el vicio financiero, que muchas veces nuestros países toman deuda y que se va por los canales este, del vicio financiero y nunca esa plata va hacia la economía real. Por eso es que estamos ante un problema, no solamente en nuestro país, sino en la región. Pero también al margen de esta introducción, yo quiero celebrar eh, este diálogo, este encuentro, y celebrar que Estados Unidos nuevamente esté en el, en el Acuerdo de París y esté propiciando diálogos y una postura muy firme a partir del presidente Biden sobre los caminos que tenemos que dar como sociedad global. Es por eso que nosotros asumimos la agenda de cambio climático como, un, como una política de Estado. Eh, a ver si tenemos un slide para poner. Bueno, este, en, otros, en líneas generales, nosotros... Eh, no solamente ratificamos el Acuerdo de París, sino que además el 31 de diciembre, que era la, era la, fue la fecha que puso eh, la Convención Marco de Naciones Unidas, nuestro país presentó una segunda contribución frente a la Convención Marco de Naciones Unidas en relación al Objetivo 2030. 
es una segunda, una segunda contribución, un 26% más ambiciosa que la, había, que la que presentamos en el año 2016. Y fue un trabajo eh, muy arduo, fue un trabajo que se llevó a cabo con mucho diálogo, con el conjunto de, los, de las provincias, porque somos un país federal, con el conjunto del Gabinete Nacional. Y es una tarea que realizamos desde la Secretaría de Cambio Climático, acá está Rodrigo Rodríguez Tolkins presente en este encuentro. Y eso lo pudimos hacer porque el Congreso de la Nación Argentina hizo lugar a una demanda de, muy, de movimientos ambientalistas juveniles, sobre todo, para que votemos una norma, una ley del Gabinete de Cambio Climático es decir, una ley de presupuestos mínimos de adaptación eh, al intercambio climático. Y ahí le dimos lugar a la creación del Gabinete del Cambio Climático que integra en el conjunto de los ministros del Estado Nacional y, y ese fue el ámbito en el cual se elaboró esta nueva contribución que para nosotros fue un desafío muy importante. Eh, nosotros al mismo tiempo, eh, bueno, adherimos al conjunto de países que nos ubicamos dentro de la carbono neutralidad 2050. Podemos pasar una, un segundo slide, se me olvidó. Eh, bueno, para dar cuenta de, de nuestra postura frente al cambio climático, entendemos que hay temas concretos. Eh, medios de implementación que tenemos que poner sobre la mesa y discutirlos. Pretendemos hacerlo desde la región, desde Latinoamérica y el Caribe. De hecho, eh, hace pocas horas tuvimos un foro de ministros de Ambiente de América Latina y el Caribe, donde Argentina eh, planteó eh, esta posición de poder construir una una agenda común, a pesar de nuestras diferencias, tengamos una postura común con respecto a esos medios de implementación y al financiamiento necesario para dar cumplimiento a lo que nos comprometimos en el Acuerdo de París. Y es así que, que nosotros queremos necesaria una transición energética, eh, es decir, la utilización de, del gas natural como un combustible de transición, eh, para nosotros es uno de los temas a, a contemplar. Al mismo tiempo, la, el fortalecimiento de los ecosistemas, como mencionábamos antes, los bosques, los océanos, los humedales. Nosotros tenemos en el Parlamento eh, la intención este año de poder modificar una norma que hace 13 años permitió reducir la tasa de deforestación de nuestros bosques nativos. La selva paranaense en la provincia de Misiones, el Parque Chaqueño en la provincia de Formosa, Chaco y Santiago del Estero, y las yungas de las provincias de Salta, de Jujuy y de Tucumán. Son ecosistemas muy necesarios, pero también el avance de la agricultura eh, representa un problema, sobre todo la agricultura pensando en términos de obtención de utilidades y para alimentar animales, no para alimentar a personas en el marco de la soberanía alimentaria. Entonces, si esa frontera sojera de la soja se sigue ampliando, nosotros realmente vamos a tener problemas. Por tanto, queremos mejorar esa ley este año, al mismo tiempo que, que también tenemos que pensar fuertemente, que también representa un porcentaje de nuestras emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero, que es el transporte y la movilidad sostenible. Sin lugar a dudas, necesitamos mejorar esa infraestructura, pero lo tenemos que hacer a base de un financiamiento claro, esos financiamientos blandos que muchas veces América Latina eh, no utiliza o escasean en relación a lo que se había acordado eh, en el Acuerdo de París en el 2015. Y también eh, tenemos una política muy fuerte, muy activa, con un financiamiento del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo que esperamos renovar durante el tercer trimestre de este año y que es una política muy ambiciosa y muy fuerte con respecto al tratamiento de los residuos. Nuestro país tiene 5.000 basurales a cielo abierto. Es un número enorme que tenemos el desafío de revertirlo, de remediarlo, de construir estructuras para el buen tratamiento de esos residuos que también son emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero y afectan al calentamiento global, como todos nosotros sabemos. Ahora, 
eh, al margen esta crisis pandémica y esta crisis de deuda de nuestra región nos llevó a tener una pérdida del Producto Interno del 8%. Pero también las estimaciones indican que cuando termine o a mitad de este año las estimaciones indican que habrá 37 millones de personas sin trabajo. Por tanto, creo que esa es una idea de fuerza que quiero remarcar porque sin dudas eh, no estamos en la etapa de solamente declararnos a favor y abonar a la idea del cambio climático y las lindas palabras, sino que estamos frente al desafío de la acción, de la acción ambiental efectiva. Y es por eso que celebro este encuentro y celebro el ordenamiento que entiendo hoy globalmente se configura a partir de la incorporación de Estados Unidos nuevamente frente a la agenda de cambio climático. ¿Podemos pasar este, un slide más? Bueno, entre esas normas que antes mencionaba, me faltó eh, comentar acerca de lo que significó la ratificación de Argentina sobre el Acuerdo de Escazú, eh, que incorpora a los movimientos ambientalistas a la discusión de la agenda ambiental de los distintos países. Y esto Argentina lo hizo eh, con, con mucha felicidad porque creemos en esa relación entre el activismo, la militancia y las políticas públicas. Eh, mencionaba antes lo de la ley de modificación de la ley de bosques. También eh, tenemos ya en el Parlamento y quizás en este mes de febrero pueda tratarse y pueda ser aprobada como una ley la ley de educación ambiental, para que en todos los niveles educativos eh, se eh, pongan en la currícula eh, los elementos ambientales para conformarse una ciudadanía crítica, una ciudadanía con concepto ambiental y poder tener una, una ciudadanía con mayor grado de conciencia ambiental. ¿Podemos pasar? Eh, en este sentido, nosotros eh, sin dudas creemos que, que tenemos una oportunidad enorme, una nueva eh, manera de cooperar entre los países. El Papa Francisco dijo que eh, tenemos que cuidar nuestra casa común. Y también todos adherimos al concepto de que nadie se salva solo. También lo pronunció nuestro presidente Alberto Fernández. Tenemos que no solamente pensar en estructuras económicas con el, en el marco de la sostenibilidad, sino también tenemos que construir una idea común. Tenemos que pararnos sobre el principio de la cooperación y no de la competencia. La competencia nos llevó a cometer estos errores garrafales que hoy se ven de manifiesto en cada evento climático pronunciado que se desarrolla a lo largo y a lo ancho de este mundo. Nosotros tenemos sequías pronunciadas, tenemos estrés hídrico, tenemos eh, pérdida de agua en las cuencas importantes, tenemos eh, basurales en, en todo el país. Es decir, nosotros tenemos que poner por delante la idea de que lo ambiental no es un obstáculo al desarrollo, sino que lo ambiental es parte de la solución al desarrollo, al desarrollo sostenible. Y también tenemos un desafío grande, que es construir entre todas las naciones, entre la sociedad global, una ética de la responsabilidad ambiental para poder eh, tejer, construir, elaborar puentes, muchos, cien miles de puentes, miles y miles de puentes, para que las próximas generaciones puedan seguir disfrutando de este planeta. Porque lo que está en riesgo, sin dudas, es la permanencia de, la, de las personas, de la humanidad. Y entonces ahí radica nuestro desafío, nuestro ahínco en pedirle al mundo y ser parte de las discusiones mundiales para que podamos construir un mundo mejor, una sociedad mejor. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, as it was mentioned, indeed, we are here to learn, to improve, to ask ourselves the ontological questions and to take action. We will now give the Zoom to our panel of experts. First, we'll have Karen Mountford, 
Vice President for Climate and Economics from the World Resource Institute. Ms. Mumford, the Zoom is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Luz, and thank you, Minister Cavandier, uh, Embajador uh, Arguello, for your leadership and that of Argentina in this space. Thank you very much to the Embassy of Argentina for organizing this discussion. It's so critical today um, and for inviting us to co-host. I'm very pleased to be here to be able to speak on some of the importance of climate leadership and how it can actually help Argentina and other countries to build back better after the COVID crisis to really establish the new normal that the minister mentioned and attract the investment and finance needed to deliver that. So first, I would like to start by commending Argentina for its commitment to aim for net zero emissions by 2050, as was announced during the Climate Action Summit in December and now referenced in Argentina's updated NDC. Thank you for that. Argentina has joined with this a rapidly growing group of countries around the world now 63 countries who have committed to or informally announced pledges to reduce their emissions to zero in the coming in the coming years. If we include the United States in this and the Biden administration has clearly signaled their intention to do so, this means that 53% of global greenhouse gas emissions are now covered by net zero commitments by countries. And companies, investors, states and cities are also setting their own net zero commitments. It's truly now a race to zero. Building on this momentum, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently announced that the central objective of the UN for 2021 is to build a truly global coalition of carbon neutrality. With Argentina's commitment, you're firmly a part of this, and we now have over half of G20 countries in this club of net zero leaders. 2021 really is a critical year for us to ramp up global progress toward climate resilient zero carbon economies in advance of COP26 in Glasgow this November. But of course you can't get to net zero emissions in 2050 without taking significant steps along the way and setting benchmarks for that journey. That includes setting a strong 2030 greenhouse gas target. Argentina has recently announced a new target uh, that is almost 26% lower than its per previous Paris Agreement target, the NDC. This is great news as Argentina is also joining 72 countries around the world who have submitted updated NDCs as part of their commitments last year or this year. That's important. It's critical to look at this NDC, this 2030 target, and make sure that it actually aligns with what you need to get to net zero in 2050. We've seen a number of other Latin American countries stepping up to the plate on this as well, including Colombia, which committed in December to a 2030 emissions reduction goal about 37% lower than its initial target, Chile, which has stepped up earlier last year, and Costa Rica as well. It's got a very ambitious target in Costa Rica. Now, these commitments to step up climate action are all the more impressive because they've come forward during the midst of this global pandemic, the COVID health crisis, the economic crisis, uh, the inequality crisis, the employment crisis, and as the minister mentioned, the debt crisis as well. These are not easy times. We know that. And despite these countries are coming forward with more ambitious climate action. In large part, this is because they reflect a growing realization of the potential that low carbon investments can bring to the economy, to growth and to a better world. So we know, for example, that they can deliver more jobs, better economic benefits, and of course, health benefits compared to the alternatives. If you take for each dollar that might be invested in renewable energy or energy efficiency, for example, it will generate about double the jobs that the same investment would make in coal or gas. So if you're looking for generating jobs, it's better to invest in renewable energy or energy efficiency. Similarly, in public transport and walkways and bike paths, these are going to deliver more jobs than investments in coal or in gas or in roads. Similarly, nature-based solutions, such as destroying, degrade, restoring degraded lands, coastlands, coastal lands, agricultural lands, can also generate a lot of jobs. 
So there's much that can be captured through the stimulus and the economic recovery efforts. And even in Argentina, there's more that you could probably do to capture some of these benefits as you work on uh, your economic recovery to ensure it's green and inclusive. A green recovery is also very well placed to attract the investments and finance needed to deliver this economic recovery, including international finance. And this is a priority that the minister mentioned. We've seen a very clear trend over the last couple of years with the smart money increasingly moving away from fossil fuels, first coal, now oil and gas, and towards clean solutions. We have more and more asset owners, asset managers that are shifting away um, from fossil fuels and towards the clean solutions are looking to those kinds of investments. So this is definitely a trend where you can actually harness the benefits of green recovery for investment and finance. It's great to see how much more Argentina is doing already to step up your ambition. You were already one of the four countries in Latin America to implement a carbon tax, which is estimated to cover about 20% of the country's emissions. In 2019, the government declared a climate emergency and adopted the national law on climate change. Um, and you're moving forward with many more efforts. I wanted to congratulate also the minister on the announcements around the forthcoming forest protection law, very essential to protect those resources and those carbon six, and also the ratification of the ESCOSU agreement, really critical for advancement. So Minister Ambassador, thank you again for this important leadership. At World Resources Institute, we look forward to continuing to work closely with you and your teams to deliver a future that is better, that's greener and more inclusive. We're now cooking off a multi-year program with Argentina to support the implementation of your long-term strategy on, on climate. In partnership together with Fundación Bariloche and UNDP Argentina and with support of the German government. We're looking forward to working with you on this. We're hoping that work will help align Argentina's long-term strategy and net zero commitment with your national development plans and help to inform your future NDCs. We look forward to working with you. Congratulations and thank you again for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. We will now give the Zoom to Pablo Vieira, Global Director at the Nationally Determined Contribution Partnership. Pablo, the Zoom is yours. Muchas gracias, Luz, eh, Ministro, Embajador. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Es un verdadero honor estar aquí. Ahora permítanme, voy a pasarme a inglés. Um, um, again, as Helen said, let me first congratulate Argentina for the submission of its second NDC and for your commitment to carbon neutrality. Um, the new NDC represents an increase in ambition of over 25% uh, with absolute and unconditional targets that cover all uh, sectors of the economy. But most importantly, it is an NDC that has been closely aligned with the country's view of a fair and inclusive sustainable development. Argentina's climate ambition is a clear example of its leadership in the region that is fully committed with strong climate action. Uh, it is important to highlight that around half the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, 17 of them, have already submitted a new NDCs, and that most of them are better in quality and more ambitious, with stronger commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and with new and more ambitious adaptation objectives, uh, highlighting the importance of these elements for the region as the minister has presented. There are many elements of Argentina's NDC um, and the process through which it was drafted that positioned the country as a leader as, and as an example in the region. Uh, the importance uh, of the work that has been done needs to be highlighted and ideally shared with the region and with the world. First, let me pick a couple of examples. The first one is the importance that the country gives to the development of climate policies through multi-stakeholder engagement and consensus with these critical stakeholders. The National Climate Cabinet is presided by the head of the Ministerial Cabinet and is technically coordinated by the Secretariat of Climate Change, Sustainable Development and Innovation, giving a whole of government approach to climate action. Its objective is to oversee the coordinated implementation of the National Climate Change Adaptation and Mitigation Plan and all related policies that lead to the reduction of emissions and improvement of resilience. 
through this coordinated approach, the different ministries and sectors commit directly to climate action, uh, transferring that responsibility from the Ministry of Environment in many cases, and making sure that resources from the different sectors are used effectively to promote climate action and that climate plan and that the plans for sectoral development are aligned with that vision. Argentina's National Climate Change Cabinet is a clear best practice that will inspire many countries on how to effectively mainstream climate action across policies and stakeholders. The second example is how Argentina has developed a model where climate action is actively promoted at the subnational level. The Argentinian Network of Municipalities for Climate Action is an organization that brings together 210 municipalities with the objective of promoting public policies and effective action to fight climate change. During COP25, uh, the work of this network of municipalities was recognized with the Green Champions Prize awarded by the GCF. But more recently, this organization has taken a next step by starting working on creating the first fiduciary fund to promote investments for climate action at the subnational level. And we know how challenging it is to, to effectively channel resources to the subnational level, even though they are the ones that are facing directly the challenges of climate change and have the capacity to implement the actions on the ground. Many countries in the Latin American region and around the world would benefit from the experience of this network of municipalities, as it is a common challenge for national governments and subnational stakeholders to effectively work together in climate action. These elements that could be, could be fundamental in the proposed regional vision for climate action that the minister has just presented. I feel that the region of Latin America and the Caribbean has to build its own narrative as the minister has presented and clear examples of leadership from countries like Argentina and others in the region can lead this exercise so that we can more effectively mobilize the resources that are needed for that implementation. Once countries submit their updated NDCs, which is happening now and, and for Argentina, it has already happened. They start to focus on uh, developing detailed implementation plans and identifying technical and financial needs to be able to achieve their new commitments. This is where multilateralism and the collective effort by countries and institutions is needed to actually drive the implementation of these more ambitious commitments. As the minister very well said, resources need to be mobilized to effectively implement these actions. In this context, the NDC partnership is well positioned to connect uh, the identified needs by countries with the technical and financial support they need. The partnership guiding principles and operational model illustrates the huge potential that cooperation and collaborative approaches have in effectively tackling climate change. Our membership continues to grow and today we have 186 countries and institutions that are members of the partnership. Of its 94 developing country members, 75 are currently receiving support. And to support them, the partnership has been able to mobilize around $1 billion through member-led initiatives, where over 120 member and non-member partners are providing the support to cover government needs. Our experience has shown that in order to drive climate action in the most effective way, there are four critical principles. The first one is a country-driven approach where priorities and needs are identified by governments based on their realities. Only through a country-led effort, it can be guaranteed that climate change action is mainstreamed and integrated into policies, legislations, and planning processes. Second, coordinated action by national and international stakeholders, integrating efforts by multiple organizations and donors, reducing the burden on governments, preventing duplication of efforts, and fostering synergies by this collaborative effort. Third, a single framework of collaboration where needs are identified and resources are mobilized through a comprehensive approach to climate action in the form of, for example, NDC implementation plans, collective impact and economies of scale are achieved. Fourth, once countries identify their priorities and needs, an effective matchmaking process is needed, where those that have the competitive advantage in terms of knowledge, experience, and available resources are identified and connected with the government needs. And finally, as I said before, effective implementation is all about effective mobilization of finance, public, private, national, and international. We need to unlock the billions and trillions that will effectively support the implementation of this round of NDCs if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. This is our current biggest challenge. All of these principles have been the foundation of 
the partnership engagement with Argentina, where UN, UNEP and the 2050 pathways are supporting the government in the development of its long-term strategy with its final strategy, the development of a coordination mechanism with the scientific community for effective climate action, and the implementation of nature-based solutions amongst other actions. But now we can't forget about the global context we're currently in. The COVID crisis represents a huge challenge for governments and attention has shifted, rightly so, to urgent matters related to health and economic recovery. But as Helen was saying, this crisis presents a unique opportunity to build back better by incorporating climate priorities into recovery plans. It is time to put an end to the false, false dichotomy between economic growth and sustainability. Effective climate action drives job creation, economic growth, and the achievement of economic and social goals for the well-being of everyone around the world. And this can be only achieved if countries mainstream their climate priorities across sectors, budgets, policies, and plans, as Argentina is doing. The NDC partnership is a community, and we firmly believe that all our members have something to bring to the table. The diversity of our membership brings perspectives, knowledge, and resources from every corner of the earth that can effectively drive ambitious climate action. We invite Argentina to share its vision, achievements, and lessons learned to guide and inspire countries in the region and global. Thank you for the opportunity. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we'll give the tune to Lisa Visidi, Director of Energy, Climate Change, and Extractive Industry, Industries Program at uh, the Inter-American Dialogue. Thank you, Luz. Um, I really want to thank the Embassy of Argentina and WRI for the invitation to participate in this really interesting discussion. Uh, it's a very exciting time, both in Argentina and in the U.S. Um, so I want to talk to you today about why I think that the renewed focus on climate change in the United States provides a great opportunity for the U.S. to be cooperating more with Latin America. Um, so as, as most of us know, the Biden administration has made it clear that climate change is going to be an integral part of foreign policy. Um, and I think, you know, the administration might be tempted to focus mostly on other regions of the world first, particularly Asia, where we have the fastest growing emitters, China and India, um, also Europe, which has among the countries that are the most committed to partnering and tackling climate change. But I wanna argue that the climate team should start with Latin America and that there are actually a lot of issues um, where both the United States and countries in the region could benefit from cooperation, from clean energy to climate adaptation to conservation. Um, so getting into some of these issues, I mean, first, I think it's important to acknowledge in the energy transition that some Latin American countries have really been leaders on clean energy in many ways. So for example, South American countries actually pioneered the concept of renewable energy auctions, which has been very successful. Uh, Brazil is a leader in biofuels, you know, just to give a, a few examples in the region. Um, but despite this, in general, I think Latin America still really needs to do a lot more to accelerate the energy transition. Uh, there's a big need to reduce fossil fuel demand and put more sustainable low carbon energy systems in place for the future. And this requires capital and it requires the deployment of new technologies. And I think this is gonna be a big challenge for Latin America, especially following the severe economic contraction resulting from the pandemic. So I think the US is very well positioned to, to help to fill this gap. Um, now the US cannot oblige its private companies or its private banks to invest in and lend to Latin America the way China does. Um, but the U.S. can make targeted investments through, for example, the development credit agencies. And this, coupled with technical assistance on some of the policy and, and regulatory frameworks, could help incentivize private sector investment. And I, I think that would be, um, you know, the approach that the U.S. could take. Um, many Latin American and Caribbean countries really need to step up their deployment of modern clean technologies, uh, smart grids, electric vehicles, energy storage. These are just a couple of examples of, of the technologies that really need to be uh, introduced on a mass scale to move toward low carbon economies. And I think that the US government could better position its companies to provide some of those investments. And this in turn would also help the US economy. Um, so just to give one example in Argentina, 
um, many companies were awarded contracts to develop renewable energy projects, uh, but the projects didn't come online on time in large part because they, they weren't able to access financing. So I think this is one example of how loans or equity investments through the DFC, our, our, our development credit agency, which now has an expanded mandate and more tools at its disposal, could help to crowd in private sector investment uh, if the right policy incentives for renewables are, are in place. Um, I also think it's important, though, to talk about adaptation, because uh, in some ways, Latin America and the Caribbean is the most vulnerable region um, to climate, the region that's most vulnerable to climate change. Um, so already we're seeing more severe hurricanes, especially in the Caribbean and Central America. There are drastic changes in rainfall patterns in the Andean region, in the Amazon region. Um, you know, so this is already a severe problem. And I think the U.S. should play a role in helping these countries adapt to climate change, um, particularly, for example, through foreign assistance, through organizations like USAID, through the U.S. contributions to the Green Climate Fund. Um, I think the U.S. can can help to improve systems for projecting extreme weather events, help develop plans to prepare for natural disasters and changing weather patterns uh, with resilient infrastructure. And I think climate resiliency and the energy transition really go hand in hand. It's all one and the same because both require countries to build more sustainable infrastructure. Um, and so going back to you know, what I mentioned about investments in new technologies, you know, this has a, has a role in climate resiliency as well. So I think um, in addition, helping countries to adapt to climate change uh, would actually help stem the flow of migration from some countries where we already see that climate change affects people's livelihoods and leaves them to have to leave their country and come to the US. Um, and then finally, I think it's important to mention conservation. Uh, about half of Latin America's greenhouse gas emissions come from land use change tied to practices like agriculture and deforestation. And this is very different from the rest of the world where energy is the source of about two thirds of emissions. So deforestation and, and land use change is a huge issue for Latin America. Um, and if deforestation in the Amazon, for example, continues and we reach the tipping point where the forest starts to convert to savanna, this could affect rainfall patterns as far north as, as North America in the United States. So what I wanna say here is that uh, the United States will benefit from offering assistance to countries to fight deforestation. And essentially, in conclusion, cooperating on all these issues bring be brings benefits for Latin America and the Caribbean, but it also very clearly serves the US's strategic interests. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important message that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about bilateral cooperation between the US and Argentina, as well as other countries. So uh, thank you again for the invitation and uh, pleased to speak more in the Q&A, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, we will now start our Q&A session. Firstly, we will address some questions that we have received through the registration process, but we please encourage everyone to post their questions through the Q&A chat. And we ask all the panelists also to please feel free to unmute yourself if you want to complement any comment given by other panelists and feel free to discuss among yourself any ideas or any insights you have regarding any any idea. So there is a first question uh, that is directed to Pablo Vieira. That is, is this MDC partnership only meant for countries or should individuals and private sectors from various countries be part of it as well? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, membership uh, in the partnership um, is open for countries represented by governments by international institutions such as uh, intergovernmental organizations, uh, multilateral development banks, um, and UN organizations and others, and for organizations that represent non-state actors, NGOs, academia, um, uh, the private sector guilds uh, that all come together to support uh, action on the ground. Uh, individuals uh, are not part of the membership. Um, uh, we invite members 
that have the capacity to provide support to countries uh, based on their requests. Um, and of course, uh, you don't need to be a member to be active. Once we work with a country, uh, we map out the needs and the activities and uh, uh, more than half of the support currently is being provided to 75 countries by non-members that are active on the ground at the country level, including private sector and small NGOs and others. So everyone is invited to join or to actively participate in the engagement we have with the countries. And you can come to the webpage and, and see where we are and what we're working on and who's engaged and happy to respond to any specific questions on Argentina or other countries around the world. Thank you. Uh, we have now a question for Helen. Um, how the growing demand for development is going to be reconciled with the necessity to control carbon emissions? Uh, thank you, Luz, and, and absolutely, I think this is something which people have been uh, very concerned about for, for, for many years, increasingly so now in the context of the COVID crisis, the economic employment and inequality crisis. Um, I think the important thing is that we do see now that actually climate change, climate action, what we do on climate action can actually contribute to stronger, better growth. It's not a trade-off. As uh, the minister said, as Pablo said, it's not a trade-off. These actually go together hand in hand. Um, so we have been seeing in the context of the COVID economic recovery, we've actually been seeing a number of countries, including the EU, which dedicated 30% of its economic stimulus uh, to climate action. We've seen some exciting movement in Canada, in South Korea, China, Colombia, Nigeria, um, all looking at how to do a green recovery in order to boost their economic recovery, their social recovery, but also contribute to climate action. And if I could just highlight two examples of, of where we're seeing some of, through some of our work, these opportunities. We have analysis at WRI and with the New Climate Economy Project, um, looking at what might be a new economy for Brazil. And we released this just last August. And one of the things that we found in that work is that by 2030, if Brazil adopted a much more low carbon climate resilient economic recovery, Brazil could actually get a net increase of over 2 million additional jobs compared to a business as usual path in 2030 and a GDP gain of over $500 billion by 2030. There'd also be a reduction in air and water pollution with benefits to health of all Brazilians as a result and more resilient livelihoods and food security in the face of extreme climate events. So really important and exciting that there are those opportunities in Brazil. Now we're engaging with colleagues, um, different ministers, but also the states and the states of the Amazon are really excited about some of these opportunities. The governors want to discuss what more they can do. The business sector and the finance sector is really getting behind this kind of green opportunity. We've seen the same in Colombia. We've been working very closely with President Duque and his team there. Um, and one of the things we found is that the more ambitious pathway they're taking now through their NDC will actually result in 2050 with an additional 1.4 million better paid and higher quality jobs compared to the current trajectory. Um, and would lead to higher per capita income uh, on average, economic growth that's stronger, and also some of those other benefits in terms of regional and health and gender benefits. So there's really an opportunity to seize now as part of the economic recovery to go green in a way which will deliver a better, stronger, and more equitable recovery. So this is the moment to seize it, not to see these anymore as a trade-off, but actually how they can work together and deliver more. Thank you so much, Helen, for the data. And now we have a last question. We don't have much time left. It's for Lisa. Lisa, you mentioned the USAID as technical cooperation. Which areas of technical cooperation do you think the US and Argentina could have in this particular subject? Um, well, I think there are lots of different areas where the US and Argentina could cooperate. And I think that um, you know, with the new administration, we're going to have to see, you know, how, where the priorities are. Uh, Biden just issued an executive order just a few days ago, which kind of outlines a broad plan and includes foreign policy. And then it, it basically takes some of his campaign promises and directs different agencies of the government to actually implement those plans and, and 
develop the plan and then implement them. And so it's going to be the responsibility of organizations like USAID to come up with those plans. Um, and, and it depends on funding from Congress as well. So they will, you know, they will um, be subject to, to what can be done in Congress. But I think to give some specific areas, biodiversity is a very important area for USAID, and there's already uh, program funding there. Um, programs for conservation are already in place, and, and there's already there's also a lot of potential there. And then I think there's going to be an increasing focus on clean energy. Uh, so I think, you know, my point of view, there could be opportunities um, both in renewable energy, but I also think it would be really important to look for opportunities for clean transport, which is an area that, you know, as the minister said, it needs to be an important part of climate change. So I think I, I would uh, include those as well. All right, thank you so much. We have come to the end of this webinar and we wanna thank you so much for the speakers. We will be uploading this recording to our YouTube channel. That is the Embassy YouTube channel. Um, again, thank you so much, Minister, and to all the speakers who has been participating today and for sharing this valuable data with us. Gracias. Luz, Jorge, Lisa, Pablo, Helen, un gusto compartir este encuentro. Adiós. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias.